Well, hello and welcome back. Um, as we approach the topic of adaptive immunity, I think that it's interesting to look at some of the results. Of course, we're getting numbers every day about the COVID-19 pandemic. And I got to admit that every day I don't have the same reaction. Sometimes it's just ongoing reporting of those numbers. And my recollection of what was it yesterday or a week ago isn't that good. But uh, on Saturday, there was a comparison that really made a difference to me. And because it, it kind of brings into focus or brings into question what every country in the world is dealing with, how do you blend the medical information, which is the science, together with the political information, which is the social, science and social. What do you know? What do you do with it? And so I remembered these numbers and I want to, I, I made a little note. And what it was, it was a comparison of new cases of COVID-19, the coronavirus infections based on the national statistics that were coming out. And the comparison was what I think is really more comparable comparing the United States and its new cases with the entire European Union. I think we often, I have an open question mark in my mind when you, uh, for instance, compare Germany, France, England, and the United States, uh, given the number of people in the area they have to deal with, um, many of their countries are more like our states. And in comparing the whole European Union with the US, I think it's a more valid comparison. So here's what we saw from a beginning around the first of the year where the new cases were zero, there were no reliable statistics. We got into March when the new cases of COVID-19 being reported shot up. Now the European Union shot up to about a maximum of 23,000 new cases reported per day and reached a peak and then began to decline. Our epidemic was slightly delayed from the European Union, but only slightly. I don't think it was even a week behind. And our new cases per day shot up to a maximum of about 25,000 and hit a peak and began to decline. So we hit the peak of new cases per day at about the same time. And I want to point out what new cases per day actually is. It's you want to manage the new cases per day well within the capacity of your medical community to provide medical treatment and healing for those new cases. What was so interesting about Saturday's report is they looked now, which is basically two months later. And whereas the European Union from that peak of around 23, 24,000, its curve basically went way back down. And so now they're reporting what looked like to me on the graph about 4,000 new cases per day. So from the peak, it came dramatically down and they're reporting 4,000 new cases per day over the entire European Union. In contrast, the United States peaked a little higher, I think 24, 25,000 was the peak I saw in looking at it quickly. And though well, it's, it started down, it basically produced a flat curve across. So the variation for the last two months has been between a low of 20,000 new cases per day and a high of about 23, with a noticeable spike that developed maybe three weeks ago, went up and down where the United States decided to open up and go back to uh, less limiting of contact and uh, basically a, a partial opening of the country. So it's kind of interesting to me, social behavior, governmental regulation, medical advice all blended together in the European Union to reduce, substantially reduce their new cases per day. They basically are uh, reporting, I would say, uh, between a, a fifth uh, and a fourth 
uh, the number of new cases per day in the European Union that they're reporting all across the United States. We have been, our social system has, and our leadership has led us to basically a flattening of the curve. So we have enough doctors to deal with the number, but uh, we also are still just right now covering the, um, the uh, new cases. So I think it's it, it, very interesting, this unique historical event that we're experiencing right now and seeing how different areas in the world are responding and what success and what failure uh, they're having. And that brings us to what we normally think of when we think of immunity, and that is adapted or acquired immunity. We're born with our genes, which is what supplies our cells, our antibodies. We're born with a certain capacity to become immune. But it is the experience of our early life, especially, that sets that immunity. So at one time, certainly in my childhood, um, I remember when the first broad availability of polio vaccine was present. It was such a terrible disease and a crippler of children that the conquering of polio through vaccination was a medical miracle. But at that time, all children, myself and my four siblings, to, 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 to give an example, contracted and lived through measles, mumps, chicken pox, and what was called German measles at the time, and recovered with immunity intact. And that was adaptive immunity. Those childhood diseases were a part of child, childhood. Now we vaccinate against those to produce these specific immune responses. What we see here is sort of the basis, the interaction of a cell of the body uh, with a lymphocyte. And this has been, these have been tagged with different fluorescent dyes to identify them as different populations of cells in this magnification. This is involving an antigen that has been derived from the infectious pathogen. And that antigen has been presented on an infected cell uh, called an APC, an antigen presenting cell. So it has identified that cell as infected. And that has attracted the red cell, which is a lymphocyte, which is attacking and destroying this cell. This is a system called the major histocompatibility complex. Uh, histocompatibility means tissue compatibility. And it is a way that we can reduce the effect of an infection and to limit its spread. Adaptive immunity has a number of kind of general properties and we can discuss them. Every one of them will be subject to the genetic variation that I, I spoke about. So when we when we talk about specificity, the normal thing we think about is a single antibody. That would be an immunoglobulin uh, in terms of the proteins in the blood. And one pathogen, one particular attack or vector, one way that it uh, enters our body. Now, this is difficult to deal with because biologically, We've had this bias in our science. We understand things that are most like us, things that are diploid, things that reproduce sexually. The species and subspecies and variety naming that we do is pretty effective uh, for uh, sexual reproduction. But when you get to microorganisms, especially organisms have the ability to exchange genes so they can recombine their nuclei, and mix those genes into new combinations. At the same time, they can reproduce by vegetative means, just by dividing mitotically. Um, the species concept kind of breaks down, so it's hard to um, uh, say anything definitive about this, the taxonomy of these pathogens.
pathogen is anything that hurts you. So it can be a toxin. It can be a molecule like a virus. It can be a living cell like a bacteria. A eukaryotic cell, and there are several diseases that are caused by microorganisms that are eukaryotic. Uh, it can be a um, fungus. Fungi produce a number of different disease conditions in humans. Um, it can be a member of the animal kingdom, uh, the parasites that occupy our body. Um, adaptive immunity. Our body has versatility, meaning that potentially the number of antibodies we can make is huge. Now, how do we estimate that? When we learned we could inject something into a rabbit, wait 10 days and harvest its blood and check its serum and check it for reaction to proteins. If, that, if it reacts, we know it's developed an antibody. And by doing broad scale kind of tests in this way, we found out, wow, the rabbit's uh, blood system can react to many, many different antigens. And by testing blood samples in humans, we find the same kind of versatility. This was one impediment. People started saying, well, immunity can't be developed on genetics. I mean, estimate how many genes it takes to make a human. And it's always, in, in my life, always been between 10 and 20, although it was closer to 10 when I started science, and it was closer to 20 now. There weren't simply enough genes to account for all the immunity we knew could develop. These genes are not all developing immunity. They're doing other things, like building bones and making muscles work. But the answer to versatility is going to be a small number of elements that are combined into different antibodies and therefore produce huge variety. Um, memory is a, a topic for adaptive immunity. By that we mean the body experiences an infection for the first time when it is naive and susceptible to that infection. So the first infection, the pathogen begins to have disease effects in the body, reproduces in the body to the point where it's interfering with homeostasis and producing disease symptoms. We can tell that the individual is sick or we can tell that their life is threatened. Um, however, if adaptive immunity responds, once you develop the antibody to that specific pathogen, then it not only eliminates the pathogen from the body, finds and attacks that pathogen while leaving the body cells intact and functioning, but it leaves behind an element that will intercept any reinfection. By that I mean, when I had measles, mumps, and chicken pox as a child in elementary school, I went back to that elementary school through seventh grade and every year was reinfected by each of those diseases. But because I had this memory of a previous infection, it actually got on top of the infection and conquered it before I developed any symptoms. So what we typically say in common language is, well, I didn't get the disease. It's true, you didn't reach disease conditions. However, you were reinfected routinely. That reinfection is something that supports and amplifies this memory. It's sort of like a revaccination or a booster. It used to occur in the natural world because we had the presence of those diseases. Now, some of those diseases are simply absent. Tolerance, a recognition of self versus non-self. And I'd say two things about this. Go back to the fertilized egg, every cell in the body having an exact nucleus that's a copy of that is the recognition of the self cell. Anything that's, that's a pathogen, any microorganism, and uh, any molecule like a virus, any um, uh, animal is going to 
be genetically very different and therefore identified as non-self. But I would hasten to say a phenomenon of the last 50 years that's been well documented and partly because we've been able to diagnose at such a fine level is that our autoimmune responses are on the rise. This is where the body blurs this difference and begins attacking self cells in a way that is detrimental to the body. The importance of these mechanisms is that there is a, a sort of an extraction from the pathogen of a, of a molecular piece called the antigen. The antigen confirms the infection. So it is the reaction of the antibody with the antigen that keys the attack by a cell mediated process, a T cell or causes uh, uh, B cells to develop from inactive form into plasma cells and crank out the specific antibody for release into the body's uh, tissues. Another feature of adaptive immunity, I just mentioned it, that first infection, you get sick. So you get a case of the disease. And it takes a while to go through these initial steps of developing that first immune cell. By the time you get to this point in the primary infection, that immune cell is there, but there's only one of them. And it begins dividing rapidly, but while it's going from one cell to two to four to eight to 16 and on up to a viable titer in the blood, the uh, pathogen, which has already produced disease condition, is running rampant. So it's going from 1 billion to 2 billion to 4 billion to 6 billion. But this, uh, this um, effect, this imbalance is not long lived because the immune cell soon becomes numerous enough that it specifically destroys that uh, pathogen and leads you to a finale of being free of it. Now, the point about the primary response is that this can be long enough that that can be a serious case of the disease. But when you are reinfected, several of these immune cells have been left behind as memory cells. That means that for that secondary infection, instead of starting back here with a naive body, you are starting with a weapon that has been specifically developed against that pathogen. So the division of the immune cell is uh, is beginning just almost at the instant of infection. And they basically divide into a high titer and destroy the invading pathogen uh, uh, on the same scale. So you basically don't even, you don't get the spots of measles or the swelling of bumps or the bumps of chicken pox um, when you are immune. These are adaptive defenses, meaning you're adapting to the conditions of your life. What does that mean? That means that in Missouri, growing up in, in Jefferson County, you're going to be immune to the typical local diseases of Jefferson County. You're not going to be developing adaptive defenses to tropical diseases. If you grow, grow up in Colombia or in Puerto Rico, then a whole different suite of diseases are going to produce different defenses in your body. Uh, hence, our um, reliance on immunization and our reliance on uh, medical awareness when we travel out of our ecological zones. There are two basic kinds of adaptive defenses. Cell-mediated depends on T cells. T cells mean that the attack cell, the living cell, carries the antibody itself. So the living cell has to be there in order for it to have a, 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 a destruction of antigens. This physical or chemical attack, there's a variety of ways it attacks, but the living cell has to be there. The attack cell is called the cytotoxic, the cell death uh, T cell. The antibody-mediated immunity is sometimes called humoral immunity. Humors is a term for the collective uh, fluids of the body. And that's because activated B cells give rise to cells that are going to produce antibodies. These are called plasma cells. And they're going to crank out not 
armed T cells, not armed cells, but they're basically going to throw the weapon, the antibody, out into the fluids of the body, and it's going to attack the antigen wherever it's encountered. So let's take a look. We call these cells lymphocytes because of the adaptive immunity. T cells are made in bone, red bone marrow. Kind of curious, isn't it? That the whole basis for this adaptive immunity, the, which we call the lymphatic system, is produced within a tissue in the cell, within a skeletal system, the red bone marrow. The T cells are going to be released in immature form from the bone marrow and circulate through to the thymus where they mature. They produce what's called cell-mediated immunity and they are much more effective against infected body cells. An intracellular threat. We're going to name cytotoxic Ts which directly kill infected body cells. Helper Ts, and not on this slide, but suppressor Ts, give us an ability to act with other elements of the immune system, including elements of the innate immune system. And the helper Ts amplify the immune response once the system is developed. The suppressor Ts would uh, have the opposite. They would suppress the immune response. So like with homeostasis, there was a way to raise the body temperature, there was a way to lower it. Like with blood sugar, a way to raise it, a way to lower it. Helper T's and suppressor T's work in concert to keep you in that self-recognition zone where you are not attacking your own healthy cells, but are attacking those infected cells. Finally, what's left behind after an episode of infection is called a memory cell. That's how we retain our immunity, a pre-constructed uh, um, uh, antibody and cell that works against a specific pathogen. Now, B cells are made in red bone marrow and they mature there and produce what's called humoral immunity. Uh, anti antigen or antibody mediated immunity. They remove an extracellular threat. They don't have to enter the cell. The cell is not yet infected, but they can clear the plasma. They can clear the interstitial fluid uh, and other locations of um, infectious elements. A plasma cell is what produces these antibodies in great quantity. And by the way, Plasma cells are recognizable because the cell is larger and it looks like the whole cell is filled with endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and it's pumping out antibody the chemical. The element that is left behind that retains the immunity is a memory cell again, memory T or memory, in this case, memory B cells. Let's take a look at uh, some of this and try to secure a real understanding of these types. So at the top, we've kind of reversed the order. B cells for extracellular antigens. So out of the body's fluids, what removes most bacteria, most toxins, virus particles from the fluids of the body, it would be a B cell effect. Understand this toxin. You know, remember that when you have a toxin, it's because it's a chemical that has a bad effect on your metabolism. Bind it with something else, like an antibody, it's a different chemical. So its toxicity may be uh, very much reduced. So here we have B cells producing extracellular and extracellular antigens reacting with them, and basically uh, removing that antigen, whether it's uh, on a living cell or whether it's a uh, toxin, leaving behind a memory cell and plasma cells. These plasma cells pump out this antibody and the toxin. You can see here the same element is coated with antibodies and neutralized. Down here, T cells for intracellular antigens, things like viruses that are inside a cell, bacteria that have already penetrated the cell, and cancer cells. There are some cancers that can be produced by T cells. Here, the T cell will produce cells like activated macrophages. Um, this, 
T cytotoxic cell will be able to destroy infected health, uh, host cells. So these are body cells. Um, in, in many cases, the uh, uh, pathogen has been absorbed into the cell and produced a protein that the cell packages and presents on the outside of its membrane. Now, this is, makes it an APC, a thing called an antigen-presenting cell. But why can it be so specific? Because the antigen is a piece of chemistry that comes off of the pathogen. That's what makes it so specific. So you take it off, you mount it on the outside of your cell. If you've got a memory T cell, it gets activated, and all of a sudden you've got cytotoxic Ts being produced that will limit and curtail that infection. Now, when I first learned of this, it was a long time ago, and we had a thing called MHC, which stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. It had just been discovered, and this process was one that was amazing to us understanding the, the details of adaptive immunity. Now we have to recognize, after decades of research, we've discussed We've discovered there are different kinds of MHC. And so this is class one, which was the original. Here is a virus infecting. You see this nucleic acid is producing proteins in the cell. Or this is a bacterial pathogen. You can see that it's producing unusual proteins, different chemical effects, non-self effects that stimulate the genes in the nucleus to produce MHC proteins. Now, the importance of this is it goes through that gene expression, the protein synthesis, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus, those great synthesizing membrane complexes, are going to identify and extract some of these abnormal proteins. So this is the bit that comes off of the uh, pathogen and the antigen itself. And it is bound and packaged as a MHC antigen complex inside the cell. Then the vesicle is transported up. Now, here is where we have that vesicle merging. We saw this in exocytosis before. That this membrane actually becomes a part of the membrane uh, of the outer cell membrane leaving this major histocompatibility complex that is activated, a class 1 MHC protein on the surface of the cell membrane. Turns out that all the cells in our body with nuclei have these class 1 MHC proteins that react to foreign antigens and that mount them on their outer surface. Cytotoxic T cells recognize this immediately and destroy this cell. Now, obviously, we do not have complete knowledge of the COVID-19 virus because there's a substantial portion of our population that is succumbing to it prior to the cytotoxic T's becoming active. We're studying now to figure out why that is. Why is it that the cytotoxic T's in those individuals do not recognize and destroy the infected cell before it ends the person's life? Conversely, why is it that so many categories of people, especially young, healthy people, <clears throat> detect uh, some effect of infection? Oh, pardon me. They detect it. They react to it sometimes just with sniffles or a mild case of the flu and recover quickly and go right back to full health. We are exploring the particular nature of uh, coronavirus to uh, reach a feasible uh, treatment that can be broadcast over the entire population. What we want is something that will help us, number one, identify the susceptibles, and number two, treat the entire uh, population. That means herd immunity, which is the target of vaccination. 
the processes for this involve here a virus infected cell and a cell called CD8. This is the inactive T cell. And what happens when uh, uh, the antigen presenting cell gets around to putting this antigen out here is there are receptors on the T cell that are activated. This is called co-stimulation between the infected cell and the T cell. Binding of this receptor um, uh, uh, here is what activates the cell. And from an inactive, I'm sorry, an inactive CD8, you produce antigen recognition to produce active T sub C. These are the cytotoxic Ts, and these are the memory Ts that will be left behind after the infection is cleared. The destruction of the target cells shown after the binding results from lysis of that cell. Once again, if you can do this before the virus have completed synthesis of all their parts, the replication of their nucleic acid and the assembly of those parts, then this essentially means the infection does not spread from this cell. It can be involving perforin. Remember, perforin was part of the complement system. Cytokines, a result of uh, that appeared uh, in the stages of inflammation. Lymphotoxin, which can disrupt the cell's metabolism selectively. All of these work on the target cell, the infected cell. Now a second system, uh, phagocyte, phagocytic antigen presenting cell or APC, results from a complex we found called major histocompatibility complex 2, and they basically work in a different way by marking a pathogen, in this case a bacteria that's marked with MHC2 protein, is now it's sort of like taking away their concealment. If it's not marked, this phagocyte may not recognize it. But if it is marked, then the phagocyte, the cytotoxic T, will attack it. In this case, the important uh, marking occurs as a result of helper T's amplifying the immune response. So they will mark, they will produce proteins that mark the pathogen. The phagocyte eats it. There's the lysosome, the death, and disassembly. And in this vesicle, we're now grabbing the antigen from those parts as parts and mounting it on the outside of the cell, now identifying a cell that is infected and targeting it for destruction. Now this kind of compatibility complex does activate cytotoxic Ts. It also activates macrophages and it causes B cells to form plasma cells and crank out antibodies. So this is one of those uh, histocompatibility complexes that reaches out to other elements of destroying pathogens and activates them all. Now, I, I would mention that um, uh, this particular uh, APC is involved in the HIV virus and AIDS complex. We find that the HIV virus has a, a particular effect on helper Ts. So you can be HIV positive as long as you have helper Ts, you maintain normal health. But if the HIV destroys your helper T cells, you lose this ability to amplify the immune response. And so the absence of helper Ts means that something that with normal medical treatment and diagnosis you would survive now becomes a lethal disease. So you don't do, you don't die of AIDS. You die of pneumonia. Most people, if they're diagnosed, you know, they notice the symptoms of pneumonia and go in and they 
are admitted to a hospital, if they're treated in the hospital, most people recover. However, if they have an active case of AIDS, they typically decline and die without effect of, uh, without uh, the effects of the medical treatment. Now here we see similar mechanisms involving cells. Here's a T cell, a CD4 T cell in this case, a different kind that produces co-stimulation and activation. And that activation causes T cells to be produced, to produce helper Ts, to produce active helper Ts, which release cytokines, and they stimulated both the cell-mediated system, the T cells, and the antibody-mediated immunity from the B cells at the same time. Now, there's a good kind of parallel to inflammation. I said inflammation was a useful mechanism when it's occurring around an injury or in a uh, chronic stage. Uh, cytokines provide the same function, activating helper Ts, activating B cells uh, in uh, a MHC2 situation. But cytokines now in their release, are one of the factors that we see in, in study of geriatric patients is an increase in the level of cytokines. And cytokines, in fact, may have a deleterious effect uh, in advanced age and be related to this process that we call aging. So we see two systems here, the CD8 for the uh, class one and the CD4 class two activating all of these T cells. And in the case where there are helper Ts, uh, basically to uh, stimulate other elements of the immune system. T helpers facilitate antibody production. We haven't illustrated that yet. We sensitize by the presence of antigens bound to these MH2 antibodies. That stimulates this B cell to begin a cell differentiation process. So this is changed, cytokines are released and the whole appearance of these activated B cells changed. Here are the plasma cells, here are the antibodies that they are producing. Notice that they are released from the plasma cell and they do not uh, need the cell in order to have the antibody antigen reaction. We basically said, oh, so we destroy the infected cells, so we destroy the pathogen. We haven't really related that to the actual character of the protein we call the antibody. So the, the point of this a single figure is to illustrate the different things that can happen when these antibodies, drawn as Y-shaped antibodies, react. Now, in this case, we're sort of illustrating the effect of B cells since the antibodies are reacting independently of, a, of the cell itself. But the same thing would apply if we're, uh, we have a T cell that is uh, using antibodies uh, on its cell surface. So here we have a virus. And here we have a toxin. Now, that Y shape includes a stem, which basically results from what's called a heavy chain. It basically provides the superstructure that the variable elements can bind to. And that always produces a Y shape, these two arms with binding sites in two places. Each antibody can produce two bi, uh, bonds to um, antigen molecules. So here we have neutralization. This virus can infect a body cell only if its chemicals on its surface can get to the membrane. If you coat it with antibody, it's neutralized. This complex then would be recognized by the body and broken down. Likewise, a toxin which is not a living cell or a huge molecule, but is something non-living that may in fact, what we call poison, our metabolism, bind it with antibodies, it's a different molecule now, no longer has the same effect. That's neutralization. 
opsonization we've mentioned. We are binding the pathogen with the antibody and that makes it visible, quote, <clears throat> makes it apparent to the phagocyte. And receptors on the phagocyte can recognize the antibody and eat it. Down here, immobilization and prevention of adherence. We're showing bacteria with flagella. These flagella often are associated with the binding to a healthy body cell. Coat those flagella and those binding sites with antibodies and the bacteria cannot infect. Complement activation we've mentioned. So in this case, the antibodies on the bacteria bind the complement protein and initiate that sequence that leads to something like C3B. And uh, in inflammation or in lysis or in opsonization, complements involved in that activation. Over here, we see something that happens when we have a population of bacteria. Notice how the fact you have two binding sites means that you can actually bridge together two bacteria and pull them out of solution. Likewise, down below, precipitation. This is a soluble molecule of some harm, but the fact you have two binding sites produces this huge complex that basically takes that molecule out of solution, it precipitates, it's no longer soluble. These are called agglutination. If you're looking at uh, the, the bacteria or uh, if you're looking at the red blood cell model, the antibodies that we spoke about like anti-A would bind the antigens, blood cell that had A antigen on their, on their uh, membranes. Finally, um, and more recently, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, ADCC is a fancy name that's been given to this natural killer binding. You notice that the cell has bound antibodies, so that means antigens have been recognized and bound, and it stimulates the natural killer to attack this complex. So we see at the chemical and cellular level, the basis for antigen antibody reactions. It reinforces our statement that what we're talking about here is protein wars, proteins of pathogens, or in some cases, the toxins interacting with proteins that we call antibodies in a way that preserves life. Let's take a look at an antibody because uh, I mentioned earlier that the number of uh, immune reactions that we can verify, that we can count. And you know, a rabbit will react to just about any protein you put it in with some kind of antibody response. So how could it be so many? And the answer is a few genes and the combination. So it isn't millions of genes. It is, in fact, hundreds of genes that are divided into different categories. The purple is a amino acid sequence that is called the heavy chain because it's larger. Now, you can treat antibody in ways that break these bonds, and so these two kinds of chains fall apart. So if you centrifuge them, you get one band of purple, which is heavy, and one band of blue that is light. Now the cell assembles those with the stem being what's called the base of the heavy chain. That, this disulfide bond holds these two copies of the heavy chain together. And where the heavy chain is solid purple, out to here, it's called the constant segment. You see this? this denotation down here. The heavy chain has sites that can bind to macrophages and sites that can bind to complements. So that explains several types of the antibody antigen binding. Uh, assembled into this, the heavy chain provides this stem structure that stabilizes the molecule and the split that starts the walk. 
<coughs> there are basically five kinds of heavy chain, and they consist of this constant segment and this variable segment. If we have a crosshatch, it's a variable segment, meaning there are several, uh, a much higher number of, uh, of protein uh, chains that are tacked onto this heavy chain that's constant and form the actual antigen binding site. So there's one stem and two sites that can bind to antigen. The light chain has a constant segment. You see the solid blue where the pointer is. It provides the recognition and binding. Constant segment, heavy chain. Constant segment, light chain. That allows the light chain to bind together. And then a variable segment that together with the heavy chain variable segment provides the antigen binding site. So this set of combinations, I mean, we learn this again and again. We have an alphabet of 26 letters. How many words can we make? Well, it depends on the combinations and the rules you want to set up. There would be a finite number of words if you said every word has to be four letters. But if you allow everything from one letter to any number of letters, then there is a unlimited number of combinations that can be made. Now, because there is this recognized heavy chain, light chain structure and constant segment, variable segment, we, we think there are five kinds of constant sites accounting for the five categories of immunoglobulins. It's the constant segments that make the difference of IgA, Ig. Uh, D and other types. We'll see the five types in a minute. And then some hundreds of these variable segments that can produce combinations. Here's an, uh, an attempt at a picture, the three-dimensional model. See here, there's the heavy chain, the heavy constant. Heavy chain is shown in orange with the constant segment splitting here. You can see that. These are individual amino acids, of course. And then forming this initial kind of globular portion, which is the heavy chain constant segment. And then this following this, the heavy chain light segment. And then out here, uh, the light chain constant segment. Notice how those are bound together. And then the light chain uh, variable segment forming an antigen binding site here and another one here. So this computer generated model does show a split and kind of does look like a Y. And it's convenient to draw Ys. So we use that as our kind of universal representation of an antibody. But it's not always direct as we expect with carbon molecules. There's a lot of opportunity for cross-reaction. So we do run into a slight magnification of the terminology of uh, immunology. Because in some cases, like we saw with metabolic reactions, we sometimes would identify an enzyme or a hormone that is needed to complete a certain reaction, but it doesn't work without calcium. It doesn't work without insulin. It doesn't work without a cofactor. And the same thing happens here. Here's a complete antigen binding an antibody. This is a direct effect. Here is a situation where a haptin, a portion of the antigen, requires a carrier before the antibody will bind. So in a situation where we're dealing with the immunology of the lower example, we have to recognize the role of haptid and carrier before we can address an effective immune response. This particular very busy table 
associated with the categories of antibodies, what we call immunoglobulins. Now, when we talked about, remember, proteins that we found in the plasma, we talked about globulins, and we talked about um, fibrin, and we talked about albumin. If it's a globular protein that has an immune effect, we identify it as an immunoglobulin. And the types that have been identified as having this effect are listed here. IgG, M, A, D, and E are listed in order. And you can kind of see the state of our, of our research into immunoglobulins. Um, some are well characterized, and we think we have a handle on what they do. Others, the properties, for example, of IgD, noticeably blanked here. IgG is a monomer. See the Y shape by the pointer with its constant segments and its variable segments. That Y shape is distinguished, and sometimes the only way you can tell one monomer from another is by a slight variation in the molecular weight. 146,000 for IgG, but 184,000 for IgD, obviously more amino acids, 188 for IgE. But those three are all monomers. IgA, you'll notice, is a dimer, and you make it simply by welding together the base plates, the, the stems and is welded together. So you get this single molecule called a dimer. There are one, two, three, four reaction sites. Finally, if you take a, and by the way, notice something. IgA has a molecular weight of 160,000 in monomer form. And the secretions of our body have IgA in monomer form. But it can also form this dimer when you bind two together, uh, in addition, you have this kind of protein clasp here. The molecular weight goes to 390,000, and it's active in dimer form in other places. Let's take a quick look at each of these. Most of our immunoglobulins are uh, IgG. Form G is a monomer, and its half-life in serum is 21 days. What does that mean? A half-life means that if you make a hundred molecules in 21 days, you're going to have 50 of that cohort left. It's a way of kind of estimating a generation time. Its properties of IgG are to attach to phagocytes, uh, to work in complement fixation, and this is the one that can cross the placenta. So the mother's IgG can go across to the baby in utero. It functions through any of the mechanisms, basically. Antibody-dependent complement uh, fixation, complement activation, opsonization, precipitation, agglutinization, basically a who's who of mechanisms that are based on IgG. Um, IgM is a pentamer. Now notice there are 10 binding sites around the outside, but a specific complexing. So since this is 360 degrees, this would be 75 degree angles all around the union in the center of the base plate. 5 to 13 percent are IgM. They only last 10 days. Uh, IgG works a lot longer, and complement fixation is um, is a major property of it, working with those complement proteins. It's the first antibody that's produced actively during the primary immune response, uh, and it's the only one produced in response to T-independent antigen. So if T-cells are not going to be affected in that pathogen, IgM is the only class of, uh, of um, immunoglobulins that's produced. IgA, monomer or dimer, 10 to 13%. So we can see that in this range, 
in the low end, we've already accounted for 95% in the first three categories. And the, the secretions secreted into saliva, milk, mucus, and other secretions, and the secretory form resists enzymatic degradation, so it is persistent. It's there to protect mucous membranes. So we talked about malt as a secondary lymphoid tissue, mucus-associated lymphoid tissue. And this is the primary immunoglobulin we see produced by, by that tissue. And it works by preventing attachment. Mucosal immunity means that in the presence of mucus and IgA means that pathogens cannot attack those cells. IgD, 184,000 Daltons, and a monomer less than 1%, only lives about three days. Its properties are unlisted, but we think it's involved with the development and maturation of antibody response. Functions have not been clearly described. Now, what do we mean by that? When you start out as a newborn, you don't actually have an active immune system. It develops. And this IgD is involved in the development of that. It leads to a very interesting speculation. It may relate to our observation about the thymus, that the thymus was actively growing and, and metabolically active during childhood, and it sort of stops and becomes the site of T-cell maturation as an adult. It's hard to tell what it's doing as an adult. There may be a critical period when we're newborn, when our immune system is most active and our immunities are set by those initial infections. And it becomes less responsive, or maybe I'd better say more quiescent, in our adult life. Um, now, IgE, 188,000 of the last monomer, way, way down there, one in 10,000 immunoglobulins. It only lasts two days, but it does attach to mast cells and basophils. <clears throat> and when it's bound like that, um, it binds antigen, causes the cell to release granule contents. This is involved, IgE is involved in many of our allergic reactions. So in a way, uh, I, I don't know, pollen, is it gonna hurt us? Um, allergic, kind of an overreaction by the body. It functions in antibody dependent complement uh, fixation. IgE also helps in the invasion of parasites. So those are two interesting categories. Primary and secondary response. Primary on the left shows an initial infection point. This is when the antigen and the pathogen enter the body. And we notice about a four or five day uh, lag before the IgM begins to be produced and maybe a five-day lab before IgG begins to be produced. Now, from this point, the curve for the, um, the curve of, of reproduction for the uh, pathogen would be going like this if it's alive. So there's a delay in response. You don't really get a substantial production of IgG until five days into the infection. You're already sick. But the increase in concentration that goes up through the first week and uh, by the end of the second week um, will get on top of that infection since it's a specific response and eliminate the pathogen from the body. As the pathogen and its stimulation leaves the body, then the production of these two immunoglobulins declines. But notice it's not to zero. These are the memory cell components. So I guess what I would say is there's, for the first week of infection, there's very little response by the body. The pathogen's going wild. Whereas secondary response, these memory cells detect that moment of infection. And although IgM starts immediately and peaks 
IgG loses its mind, starts immediately, goes, as you can see, to a level much, much higher than the primary response ever achieved. And that level, that combination is sufficient to suppress the development of disease symptoms. So uh, we do have some uh, uh, unfortunate reactions by the immune system. One of those is called anaphylaxis. It comes from allergies or anaphylactic shock. People who have been sensitized, for example, to bee stings or wasp stings where a venom is introduced. Now, there is no doubt that the venom from a wasp can produce a pain reaction, but there's no way that venom can seriously poison our metabolism. There just isn't enough. However, the overreaction by the immune system, and especially activating uh, an inflammation reaction, can produce life-threatening uh, experiences. So here's the first exposure, where allergens, like in this case pollen, activate um, macrophages, activate helper T's, to produce the sensitization, plasma cells produce antibodies. But you know, this first exposure, it eliminates the reaction and uh, it's a low enough level that it does not stimulate that inflammation response. A subsequent uh, reaction though, finds that these allergens uh, uh, will affect mast cells to a great degree, IgE and granules. Notice the granules being released by this antigen antibody stimulation. And the histamines, leukotrienes, uh, heparins, uh, prostaglandins, other chemicals that cause pain and inflammation can in fact over stimulate that inflammation reaction. Where we are especially uh, vulnerable is where we act with airway constriction. So uh, the airway swelling and interfering with breathing, loss of consciousness and death uh, can occur uh, by this subsequent exposure. And you can see it's parallel to um, uh, primary and secondary response uh, for legitimate disease conditions. But because it's something like uh, the venom of a single bee or the venom of a, um, or the um, sting of a wasp or the presence of a, po of a pollen grain or multiple pollen grains, uh, it's not really a life-threatening situation. We can, you know, study the interaction of all of these elements and we've named so many uh, active immune cells from the point of infection. Here are the neutrophils, look at that. So for infection, the neutrophils come and peak and they basically remain pretty high through the first, uh, for the first few days. And then by the end of the first week, they're declining. Natural killers respond quickly, but they are up and down quickly. They are followed by the presence of the maturation of here or the macrophages peak. I'm sorry, macrophages are green. The cytotoxic T's, these are arriving and peaking around day six, day seven, and are followed by the longer maturation of the plasma cells, which is peaking at a week and a half. But now at this point, all of these substances, except for the natural killers, which have reduced to zero, they're sort of the emergency response team. And the entire army has arrived by about week one and is being affected. Now, if we look at the plasma cells, then peaking here, the antibody titer in the blood, not the T cells, but the antibodies from the B cells are increasing and peaking about week three, ensuring the elimination of that antigen and the pathogen that uh, carries it. Um, this is a summary slide. I like these summary slides because if you go over the previous material, so here is class one activation, here is class two activation of those MHC proteins, what we called 
antigen presenting cells that produce our adaptive defense. The different categories are shown here, and I liked this because it made specific dotted line connections, not just the straight down effects, but the places where a particular cell could interact with another element of the immune system. Um, we can, in fact, uh, tie in with elements like uh, complement protein, natural killers, um, and uh, other, other uh, elements of the system uh, in order to achieve this final destruction of the antigens. Um, acquiring our immunity actually in involves a couple of different mechanisms. Um, adaptive immunity, well, first of all, innate immunity here, no prior exposure. You've got what you've got based on your genotype. You're loaded and ready to go when you come out here. But adaptive immunity, there are a couple of natural ways that we acquire adaptive immunity. Uh, and there are a couple of artificial ways. Active immunity means your body has the ability to produce the antibody. Now, it can be naturally acquired by having the disease. So this is the picture I have from my childhood of measles, mumps, and chickenpox. We had the disease. We can avoid the disease if we get a antigen in the form, this is typically called a vaccine. It is artificially induced and our vaccines are developed with attention to the effects on the body and those effects uh, develop from uh, the presence of the antigen. Over here in active immunity, we are in our body producing the antibody. Passive means we get the antibody, but not the ability to produce it. So the first that's naturally acquired is that uh, immunoglobulin that can cross the placenta and be present in breast milk. This means that the newborn has a certain amount of received antibodies, but as soon as those antibodies themselves go away, when the mother uh, baby is separated at birth, the placental source is cut off, and when the uh, baby stops feeding, stops nursing, the breast milk. So naturally acquired passive goes away. Um, artificially induced passive is the administration of antibodies only. So instead of injecting an antigen like you would over here, you inject the antibody. And again, as soon as those specific antibodies wear out and go away, you lose the immunity. Immunization is a population issue. The individual human body responds to antigens and in many forms, it can be active if we introduce an immunogen, basically we call that a vaccine, or it can be passive if an antibody is introduced that will prevent the disease. Attenuated vaccines, we basically take the pathogen apart and we find out what fragment can produce a long-lasting immunity, that's the ideal, but not produce disease symptoms. Generally, attenuated vaccines produce some kind of reaction. MMRV is measles, mumps, or rubella, and chickenpox. Inactivated vaccine, we kill the pathogen or parts of it, and uh, this is a weaker immunization. We usually have to booster it at, at certain uh, uh, intervals. It can be a whole killed agent, or it can be just a part. We call that an epitope. We basically judge based on the uh, immune reaction. Human papilloma, papillomavirus is uh, an inactivated vaccine. Recombinant DNA is the wave of the future where we take out an epitope and we insert that into a bacterial cell and have it make the protein we need. And we uh, will basically only then administer the protein. Uh, hepatitis B is recombinant DNA. For the future, we're going to have DNA vaccines where we're introducing the nucleic acid itself 
basically by injecting that the dna of the epitope generates the immunity in the body uh one of the one of the rubs of this is maybe there is a, a mechanism to cure a disease but it's so expensive we cannot scale it so we can't offer it worldwide this is where edible vaccines come in if we can introduce genes into crop plants for example and those proteins are produced then they become epitopes which can basically immunize immunize as a uh, basis of their uh, feeding so we're basically feeding people the active uh, protein elements that will cause them to become immune we're after herd immunity where most of the population resists the spread um, this is something that we're really looking at actively we get to the point people are resistant to having their children immunized in some cases because the whole population as long as it's immune there's no chance a little chance of that child getting the disease however as more and more people adopt that then more and more susceptibles are out there and we return to a susceptible uh, condition uh, as a result of uh, refusal of immunization so that summarizes what we want to say about adaptive immunity this acquired mechanism of immunizing a person